Would you listen now for God's word? I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way I am going, I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, drink and I will draw for your candles also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let her jar down from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, scholars call today's scene a type scene. We have type scenes in movies like Boy Gets Girl, Boy Loses Girl, Boy Gets Girl Again. This is a type scene involving a well and a romance or matchmaking situation. It's predictable to the hearers of the story. Isaac finds a wife at a well, well through this servant. Jacob also finds his wife at a well, and even Moses meets his wife at a well, Zipporah. So what always happens is a man comes from far away, and the woman helps him find water for himself and his livestock, and then a marriage is brokered. That's why in the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well in the New Testament, as the listeners were hearing that, they must have thought, oh, and then Jesus met his wife. Well, we know that didn't happen but it was a type scene that those hearers were following. Even Hagar, who would have been a few chapters before this story and who was directly related to Isaac, of course, as kind of his stepmother, if you want to bend it and make it fit that pattern. She was part of the future that came to Abraham's family and she saved his family from barrenness she is sent out into the wilderness to die through no fault of her own, but because there's jealousy in the family. And she cries out to God, and then God shows her a well. So she is not introduced to a husband there, but she is introduced to life and to the continuance of life there for her and for her son. This servant in the story of Isaac and Rebekah, who has been conscripted by Abraham to go and find a wife from Abraham's ethnic people, is a dedicated helper. He believes in God, he believes in Abraham, and he believes in his mission. And it's very obvious that prayer is important in this man's life. This man, who's never named, but he's a key part of the story. He prays aloud when he arrives at the well and says, O oh Lord, the God of my master, please help me be successful in this mission. And please let the woman who walks out and offers me water be the one. And after he places these gifts on her, he gives her bracelets for her arms and a ring for her nose, which would have been as prevalent as those of us uh, women who have well, what am I saying? Everybody has pierced ears these days. Anyway, um, not so much on the pierced noses, but a beautiful place to put an item that would be seen by everybody. So he gives her these gifts saying, I'm serious about this. And then he bursts out into another prayer. He's not awkward about it, but spontaneous and personal. He trusts in God and he trusts that prayer is just a natural response to his faith. If you've ever experienced the threat of total disaster, of your mission not being successful, or maybe of the threat of you dying, of maybe exposure out in the wilderness like Hagar or so many other people in the Bible, you know what it is to feel relief when a second chance at life comes. Hagar goes far away and is close to a well but doesn't realize it. She cries out in her anguish, 
in a prayer. God hears her cries. God hears the cries of her son, and God answers those cries. We are in a hard time in our lives right now, in our country, in our town, in our neighborhoods. Are we crying out to God? Are we remembering that prayer is a natural outgrowth of our faith? And do we realize that the more we pray, the more it strengthens our faith? Well, on this Independence Weekend, a lot of us think about the signers of the Declaration of, the Independent, uh, of Independence, our founding fathers. So many of these folks have just kind of faded into a two-dimensional cartoon status over the years when we, we think about Washington and Lincoln, but we think about them in the middle of February when it's time to sell a discount mattress on TV or a time to liquidate the Hondas in the Honda liquidation event and you have Washington and Lincoln rapping in a commercial. Well, that's fun too, but we forget that these were real, live, three-dimensional people with wants and needs and with heartache. Five of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, did you know this, were taken prisoner by the British. Several saw their homes and property destroyed. One had a son who was killed in the Revolutionary War. Many experienced terrible financial loss. I tend to think of the founding fathers and their wives as people who led these privileged lives, and mostly they did. They were white, they were well-educated, they were on the top of society. They had it good a lot of their days, but maybe not all of their days. They were not immune to the heartache that we know, and their lives were a lot shorter and more fragile than the lives we live now. I bet a lot of you have learned a lot more about Alexander Hamilton since the Broadway musical has come out. Several people have asked me if I got on a plane and went to New York to see Hamilton. Uh, no, I did not do that, and I didn't get to see it in Tulsa either, and um, you may think that I'm a unfaithful Broadway fan, but my father was very sick and dying. Uh, what was a long and miserable several days at the end of his life when Hamilton was here in Tulsa, and my family was just in hell, and we knew, knew other, no other reality. Um, so I was thinking back about that in the yard yesterday. Why didn't we go see Hamilton? Oh, yeah. But did you read this book? I did. This is the 700-page biography of Alexander Hamilton, which I and my cat really got into. I read this after the, I read the 1,000-page biography by also Ron Chernow on Grant. And I won't tell you how long it took me, but for everyone who thinks I should have seen Hamilton, well, let me tell you, I read the book that inspired Lean manuel Miranda to write the musical, and tonight for $9.95, I'm going to upload it or download it or sideload it from Disney Plus and watch it for once. After Lin-Manuel Miranda had written In the Heights and had great Tony success with that, which is all about Washington Heights in New York, which happened to be the neighborhood where my sister lived, which happens to be the highest density of Dominican Americans in the whole world outside of the Dominican Republic. After all of that success, he sat down and he picked up this new book by Ron Chernow at the time, and he read it, and he said to his fiancée, who became his wife, this has got to be a Broadway musical. Well, you will remember, if you read this book, and maybe if you've seen the musical, that Eliza Schuyler and Alexander Hamilton met when she was 22 and he was 25 during the American Revolution. He was instantly smitten with her. She was very beautiful, but not vain about it. She had dark hair and dark eyes. She had a large, loving, and wealthy family. And if you remember much about the story of Hamilton, he uh, knew who his father was, although he was born at a time when his father and mother were not married. So this threat of this stigma of what we used to talk about as illegitimacy hovered over him for all of his life and was used as an epithet against him all through his political life. His mother died very young of yellow fever, and uh, he was sent off to live with another family, so he really didn't have that much of a family. Eliza's family was big and fun and wealthy, which doesn't hurt, and well-educated. So he fell in love with her family as well as her. He called her unmercifully handsome 
because she was so beautiful. So what else do we know about Eliza? Ron Chernow says she was the most self-effacing founding mother. She had a sterling character, loyal, generous, compassionate, strong-willed, funny, and courageous. She was the daughter of a statesman, and she knew how to be in the company of statesmen. Her family was active in the Dutch Reformed Church, and although Hamilton never really went to church, she stayed faithful all of her life. Get this, within three years, Eliza had to cope with the death of her eldest son, her sister Peggy, her mother, and her husband when she was just in her 40s. Four months after Hamilton died in a duel with Aaron Burr, her father died. She loved Hamilton so much that after he died, she thought that God was saying to her, you are only allowed this much bliss in life and you've had it. And so now the rest of your life, you'll live alone. When Hamilton died, he left her with a great amount of debt. There was someone in Congress who set up the equivalent of an old time GoFundMe account with about a hundred donors to bail Eliza out of her debts. She had five surviving sons. The elder daughter needed constant care and the youngest took care of her for the rest of her life. She was a widow for 50 years and donated most of those years to starting orphanages. She started one that was headquartered in Greenwich Village. For 27 years, she was its chief fundraiser. She also went to the state legislature and won a charter for the Hamilton Free School, which ironically stood at 187th and Broadway in the Heights. She was also a committed abolitionist. Dolly Madison, you may know, is the face on the plastic wrapper of the donuts that you got out of a vending machine, but she was really the first first lady. She created what first ladies ought to be, and she created the model for the first ladies that we know now in our time. Martha Washington hadn't wanted to be involved in politics. She was happy to support her husband but remain in the shadows. Thomas Jefferson uh, had lost his wife before he became president, and Abigail Adams wrote very intellectual letters about politics back and forth to her husband, but it was Dolly Madison who became the party thrower. And all those parties involved, involved her getting key people to have conversations with each other over things like ice cream, which she was the first to serve in the White House. Thus, I guess they named the Donut and Cookie Company after her. Did you remember this part that when Madison was away while she was the first lady, the enemy during the War of 1812 came and they were threatening to burn down the White House. She was quick-witted and she took the famous portrait of George Washington out of its frame and rolled up the canvas and fled with her servants and they did indeed burn down that house. I forgot to say she had been married before to a man named Todd. They had two children. Both Mr. Todd and their oldest son died of yellow fever. So when she married James Madison, with whom she was not initially smitten, but over time they developed a very passionate romance and wonderful marriage. She had one child, and he would be the only child that Madison would be a father to. When Mr. Todd died, she had to fight for custody of her baby boy, because in those days, much like in Bible times, these ladies had no power. They were the property of their husbands, and so their children would have been the property of their husband's family. Dolly was the partner in all of the campaigns for James Madison. She threw parties and meetings every other day of the week. She was an extrovert, and she loved to talk to people one-on-one -on -one or in groups. She organized the first inaugural ball. She turned the White House into a place of meeting and interaction and had decorated it with all of the latest styles. Now remember that surviving son, Payne Todd, as he grew up, he would burn through all of the money that was left to Dolly after Madison had died. After she left the White House, Payne sold off a lot of her furniture without her knowing it. Dolly started selling off pieces of the family plantation in Virginia. And there were slaves at that plantation who begged her not to sell them off to places far away, but rather to sell them to neighboring farms so that they could remain with their own human families. And she did that. Her number one manservant, she freed. And in her oldest days, he would bring her baskets of provisions just so she wouldn't starve to death because she had no money. Abigail Adams 
the daughter of a minister who married a farmer's son who went to Harvard Law School. She and Madison, I mean, oh, sorry, that's how scandals get started. She and Adams had a wonderful romance and a long-term marriage that withstood lots and lots of heartbreak. She would give birth to one stillborn child and watch a daughter die in midlife of breast cancer and a son die in his 40s of alcoholism. She herself would die of typhoid just short of her 74th birthday and would not live to see her son, John Quincy, become the president of the United States. But many years before she was that old and that ill, she said to John Quincy as he was to travel to France with his father, these are times in which a genius would wish to live. It is not in the still calm of life or the repose of a Pacific station that great characters are formed. The habits of a vigorous mind are formed in contending with difficulties. Great necessities call out great virtues. When a mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, then those qualities which would otherwise lay dormant wake into life and form the character of the hero and the statesman. She spoke those words to a 14-year-old boy who was afraid to get on the boat and sail to France. She expected him to have the character of a hero and a statesman, which he eventually did. We mustn't forget that our founding fathers and the founding mothers who supported them were very brave people. They were people of great and strict faith in so many, in so many cases. They were people who saw bloodshed and death and who knew what it was like to have pandemics floating across the country even though they didn't use those words for them. Things like typhus and diphtheria and scarlet fever, things that we're able to survive now would kill them. People didn't live to be 95 just as a given in those times. It was a rough time in the world. So in our darkest moments, what would it be like to consider what the history books will say about you and me as we live through this time of pandemic and racial unrest? Will they say that it was a turning point when we made the world a better place? Let us remember that when a mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, then those qualities which would otherwise lie dormant wake into life and form the character of the hero and of the statesman, the stateswoman. May we all be heroes in the way we live our lives day to day in these difficult times.